All right, so welcome to the 15th video in this orchestration series. In our last video, we discussed writing for the percussion section, including the seven traditional roles that percussion instruments are known for performing in the orchestra. In this video, we're going to wrap up our final discussion on specific sections of the orchestra by addressing the keyboard instruments. We'll cover the ranges, common uses, and special considerations for the piano, celeste, and harp. So with that, let's get started. First up, we have the piano. The piano has the largest range out of any instrument found in the traditional orchestra. From A1 to D8, the piano has nearly an eight octave range, with one key dedicated to each chromatic note within said range. A pianist performs these notes by pressing a key with one of their fingers. This then triggers a hammer inside of the piano that strikes a collection of one to three strings, each tuned to the same pitch of the key that was just pressed. The higher the pitch, the more strings are struck. When the pianist removes their finger from the key, a dampener is then triggered that stops the note, keeping the piano sound from becoming too muddy as more and more overtone series are introduced with each note played. A pianist reads their music on the grand staff, which is a combination of both the treble and the bass clef. And at any given moment, a piano player can play a maximum of five notes with one hand. Six if they're pressing two adjacent notes with their thumb. Now, naturally, this is not going to be a very common technique, but it is available to you. With that in mind, whenever you find yourself writing for a piano player, please keep in mind the size of their hands and what is physically possible for a human being to reach between their pinky and their thumb. Now, the piano comes in many shapes and sizes, but the most common type found in the orchestra is the grand piano. In addition to 88 keys, the grand piano has three pedals. From left to right, these pedals are the una corda pedal, the sustenuto pedal, and the damper pedal. Of these three pedals, the damper pedal is the most frequently used. It's often called the sustain pedal, and removes all the dampers from the piano strings. This means that so long as the pedal is held down by the pianist's foot, the dampeners will not activate, and the sound of each note played will continue to ring out until the player either lifts their foot off of the pedal, or until the sound just naturally dies out, whichever one comes first. Most piano players will use this pedal instinctively to help the music sound more smooth and more fluid. As a composer, you don't really need to worry about notating it unless you have a very clear idea in mind for how you want it used. If this is the case, you can give specific instructions with pedal lines under your staves. If you don't have specific instructions in mind, but you still want to make sure that your performer uses this pedal extensively, you can always write with pedal over the staff in your music. After the sustain pedal, the una corda pedal is the second most frequently used. As I mentioned earlier, most notes on a grand piano are performed by the hammer striking more than one string at the same time. On the grand piano, the una corda pedal shifts the hammers ever so slightly to one side, so that they strike one less string per note. This introduces a slightly more delicate tone color to the sound of the instrument, and can even help reduce the volume of the instrument as well. When you want to use this pedal, simply write una corda over your staff and then tre corda when you're done. Finally, the pedal that gets used the least often is the sustenuto pedal. This one is very closely related to the sustain pedal, but it has one subtle difference that actually has a pretty massive impact. The sustenuto pedal will only sustain the notes being played at the same moment that the pedal is pressed. All notes played after will be dampened as normal. This allows for very niche effects that are more likely to be found in solo piano music. For example, using both sustained notes and staccato notes at the same time. Now, the piano is an incredibly versatile instrument and can perform pretty much any role that you'd like it to in your music. However, there are four roles in particular that you are likely to come across in orchestral music. One being to help reinforce accents and staccato chords. Two, to double instruments for color, attack, or both. Three, to present melodic or harmonic material as a solo voice. And four, 
to use the extreme ranges of the piano to double other instruments in either a super low register or a super high register. Next up, we have the Celeste. So the Celeste is very closely related to the piano. In fact, they have very similar playing mechanisms. But rather than using strings to produce the sound, a Celeste uses chimes. You're not very likely to ever come across an orchestra with a dedicated Celeste player. Typically, the pianist will double on both instruments, meaning that you shouldn't expect to be able to use both of them at the same time. The Celeste has a shorter range than the piano, sounding from C4 to C8, but it's transposed an octave lower, as C3 to C7. The Celeste also has a sustain pedal, which is used much in the same way as we saw with the piano. This instrument has a very soft and incredibly delicate tone color that makes it a very common choice in film scores. Generally, the primary reason you'll see a Celeste being used is to take advantage of this unique tone color and use it as either a solo or a doubling instrument. Moving on to our final instrument in this video, we'll find the harp. Now, the harp isn't really a keyboard instrument. In fact, there is actually a little bit of controversy about just what instrument family it belongs to. Some people like to call it a stringed instrument, and some like to think of it as a chordophone belonging to the percussion. But we'll just count it in this video as its own unique thing. The harp is another instrument with just a mind-boggling range, spanning all the way from a C1 to a C8. Like the piano and Celeste, the harp works with the grand staff. Unlike the piano and Celeste, the harp does not have a dedicated string for every single chromatic note in its range. Instead, the harp has a string dedicated to each A natural, B natural, C natural, D natural, E natural, F natural, and G natural in its range. It then uses an intricate system of pedals for raising or lowering these pitches a half step to account for the sharps and flats. Now, these pedals are often the trickiest part for composers to figure out when writing music for harp, because they bring a whole wide variety of very special considerations and complications to writing for the instrument. For example, it's very important for the orchestrator to notate the harp pedal positions at the very beginning of the piece, as well as at the top of every major section and or movement of the music. There are many ways that this can be done, but one of the most common is to use a series of dashes that look like this. In this configuration, each dash represents one of the harp's pedals, in the order that they appear on the instrument, D, C, and B on the left, and E, F, G, and A on the right. A dash in neutral position refers to that note being natural. A raised dash indicates a flat note, and a lower dash indicates a sharp note. And yes, you did hear that correctly. Raised dashes are for flat notes, and lowered dashes are for sharps. This is probably going to be counterintuitive to many musicians, but it's very important that you do not confuse the two. Now, pedal changes are possible during your music, and to notate these, simply just write the note name and the accidental underneath the first instance of the changed note, underneath your music. However, these aren't exactly something you can expect the harpist to perform too quickly. Pedal changes are best executed one at a time, or at most one per foot at a time. And every time a pedal is changed, it impacts every single corresponding note in the instrument's range. For example, the moment you raise an F to an F sharp, every single F string on the harp is raised to an F sharp. This is where some of those complications I mentioned come into place. The harp is not well suited for fast-paced chromatic passages, not in the same way that a piano is. Because in order for a harp player to switch from an F to an F sharp, they need to move the pedal. To move back down to an F natural, they need to move the pedal again. This isn't something that can happen quickly, while also having to switch multiple other pedals to quickly move through a chromatic passage. So you can see how it's more idiomatic for harps to play diatonic passages, or passages that just remain within a given key, more so than something that moves quickly through many changing accidentals. However, there is one way that you can get around this, to a certain degree. 
Harps are unique in their use of enharmonic notes. An enharmonic note is the same pitch with a different name. For example, a C sharp and a D flat are the same pitch, but they have different names depending on what key you're in. They have different names because no key can have two different versions of the same note. For example, you can't have both a C natural and a C sharp in the same key. Instead, you have to have a C natural and a D flat. Likewise, you can't have a D flat and a D natural in the same key. You have to have a C sharp and a D natural. For the most part, these enharmonic spellings, as they're called, are reserved strictly for sharp and flat notes. On a piano, these are the black keys, and there's only one key for both notes. However, on a harp, we have a totally different situation, with two separate strings being available for the same pitch. The harp has a separate string for each of the seven natural notes. So let's say, for example, you have a passage where you want the harp to trill between a C natural and a C sharp. Now, you know that you can't reasonably expect the harpist to make pedal changes fast enough to accomplish this. However, you also understand that enharmonically speaking, a D flat is the same pitch as a C sharp. So, being the creative genius of a composer that you are, you understand that D flat and C sharp are the same pitch and that the harp has a separate string for both of them. So, you write the trill with instructions to change the D string to a D flat. Now you can just quite simply get the trill you were looking for without having to worry about any impossible pedal changes. This same strategy can be used in a whole host of different situations. All it takes is some clever thinking and a careful understanding of which pitches you need to use in your music. This is why it's so common to find uh, unusual chord spellings in harp music, since they can be used to help avoid unnecessary pedal changes. Moving on, we'll end this video with a few examples of common playing techniques on the harp. First, the harp is probably most well known for its natural use of glissandi. The way the instrument is built makes it a natural choice for quickly glissing through multiple octaves worth of notes. They can be used in many different configurations, and the only real requirement for notating them is that you write the first seven notes needed for the gliss, moving in the direction that the glissando should move in. And then just use the typical notation up to the final note in the glissando. After glissandi, harp harmonics are another very commonly used playing technique. They have a very beautiful, like almost crystalline bell sound that works best in quiet and intimate moments. For notation purposes, they really only work well in octaves, where you write the sounding pitch with a small O over the note. When working in harmonics, it's best to just keep to the range of C3 to A6. Finally, the last special technique that we'll look at is pres de la table, or table, or I have no idea how that's pronounced. All I know is that this is where the performer plucks the strings much closer to the sounding board of the instrument. This creates a very different sound color, and it actually sounds very similar to a classical guitar. And with that, we've reached not only the end of another video, but the end of pretty much this entire orchestration series. There's only one more video planned, and it's going to be very different from the videos I've released so far. In it, we're going to cover my own personal strategy for putting all of this information to use. We'll learn how to take a simple piano sketch of a piece and put together a plan for orchestrating it. We'll see what kind of decisions I make and how I organize the whole process to make it as efficient and streamlined as possible. So thank you so very much for following these videos. And if you found them helpful, please like and subscribe to the channel and share the videos with anyone you think might find it useful. Thank you again for your incredible support through this entire process. It's been an incredible journey, and I can't wait to get started on the next video series. In the meantime, keep working hard, keep studying, and as always, keep writing new music.